Hello, it's Scott Manley here and I'm very happy to show an early version of Making History, the DLC for Kerbal Space Program, which is coming out soon, apparently. Now, what Making History is, is a collection of parts, a collection of missions, and most importantly, it provides a mission builder, which is a really nice user interface that lets you build missions, obviously. Now, training and scenarios have kind of existed in the games game for a while, but the mission builder has really made it a lot easier for players to do these things. So, Here's an example mission it starts you out with. It's very, very simple. Basically, it spawns a vessel on the launch pad. Now you've got to maybe create something that goes next. So you will say, uh, you'll maybe, maybe set it up so that we make a dialogue message. And it says, we connect these things together. And then the heading says, go. And Werner says, go, go, go. And that's great. And so that, that'll be what happens there. Now, we might want to test that after you've gone, that you have reached a certain critical altitude. Maybe you've got to reach one kilometer. So we set that up, 1,000 greater than. And if that happens, you can make it the end node of your mission. That's where the mission ends. And if that happens, you get a success and you go, woot! And that is the bare bones of a mission. Now, you could add, like, checks for whether you've crashed or not. So we're going to save this. Now, it also has some various objectives and whatever. You can get to pick the start, the success. You can get to pick the failure windows. And, uh, you know, read this. And that's great. Let's, okay. I'm going to overwrite that and let's try testing it. So what's going to, it's going to throw us into the vehicle assembly building. And we all know the best way to reach one kilometer up is to just strap a booster onto this or something. Where? There we go. We'll stick on one of these flea boosters and we'll find the parachute. And we will make sure these are on different stages because, of course, everybody needs to check your staging. So we're going to start the mission. And the mission logic is going to kick in, of course. So in the top right, there will be a button that will show us the, the various mission criteria here. Werner is saying, go, go, go. And I am going, going, going. And now I am gone, gone, gone. You'll notice, incidentally, new particle effects. And you'll notice the awesome success banner. Look at Bobak. He's jumping up there like a... Is that Bobak? I don't know. He's getting high. He's being awesome. So let's just save that and quit. Now, I've got a much more complicated one that I prepared earlier. Let's take a look. Uh, yeah, cancel import for now. Open this. This is the fly past mission. So you can see there's a bit more logic going on here. It's essentially a series of events. And we're going to fly this. Now this mission, uh, we're going to reset it to the start. Because of course as you fly, it you need to keep on retesting things. Okay. Activate the engine. Disable the brakes. And get off the ground. So... Uh, you'll also hear new jet engine sounds, which many people compare with, you know, va hair dryers and vacuum cleaners and stuff. I should probably get this airborne, right? Pull in the landing gear. And when I get high enough, he says, okay, turn left and head towards the target area. So, you know, you can set all these things up. You can target everything else. I can show you how that works, but let's just fly this around. This is obviously just uh, an Aeris 3A standard jet plane which the Kerbals have been using for a very long time. Since the days of C7 I believe. One of the earliest planes in the game this thing. And it's uh, been modified and reused several times. Despite the fact that its aerodynamic stability sometimes owes a little to be desired. Anyway, Jebediah is at the controls here and we're headed straight towards this. Now he says, great, it's good to see you can navigate that. Now fly back towards the space center for some more maneuvers. And I've obviously generated this all myself. I've been doing all the chatting and all the typing and all the scripting. Okay, let's set that up. Whoa! <laughs> I was trying to speed things up and then I realized that I was going to crash into the ground there. I'm just using time acceleration. Hey, Gus is coming in and said, Hey, if you want to laugh and put on a good show, why don't you try buzzing the control tower? Okay. And I totally missed the control tower there. I almost crashed it as well. 
Okay, there's the control tower is telling me to buzz. Oh! <laughs> Get a little closer this time. Yes! <laughs> what kind of crazy stunt was that? I spilled my coffee. It was the kind of crazy stunt that Jebediah Kurtman, Thrillmaster Extraordinaire, is now world famous for. Okay, so Werner tells me we need to test the engine at above 6,000 meters altitude. So can you take the altitude up, the aircraft up, as high as possible? Yes, I can. Look at that engine kick in. It's telling me to stay close to the space center because apparently there are issues with telemetry. That is what's known as a scene setting. It's not actually any telemetry involved here. I'm just trying to make the game give you a reason for hanging out near the space center because... I've, of course, scripted this so that something happens once I get high enough. Can you guess what that is yet? Oh, yeah, the engine has failed. This is great scientific data which will help make sure this doesn't happen to other pilots. You have performed great service for our program. Werner never told me that this might happen. Okay, sorry about this, but it looks like you're going to have to glide safely back to the ground. Or back to the ground safely. So I'm just going to basically make a beeline for the ground. Now the engine is broken, uh, I can't repair it, I don't have that ability. Uh, adjuster module is... I have no idea what that means. But yeah, we'll see if we can get it on the ground. Obviously I set up scripting conditions for things like landing in the water and landing missing chunks of your wings. Various characters have various reactions. If you land in the water, Gus complains about having to clean all the water out of the engine. If you break it up, then Mortimer's, you know, obviously acting like a, an accountant. But I should be able to put this down on the ground nicely. Obviously, I just did a little bit of a flare there to bleed off energy, because this thing does have a hard time landing. I end up going too fast here. 120, get over the runway. This is not a correct approach, but I don't really have flaps, so I can't really fly slowly. I don't have air brakes either, so that is my air brake, is these high angle of attack maneuvers. There, porpoise along. Now we should be a little better set up. And touchdown. Excellent. There we go, and we touched down. I successfully recovered the aircraft. Excellent! Since you landed in one piece, we can do more research on how you broke my aircraft. Oh, Werner, you cad. Yeah, so that gives you an idea of what kind of things you can do with the Mission Maker. It, the, the number of nodes available is pretty stupendous, and I've already seen other people in the Early Access group sharing various missions, but I also want to show you the parts here. So let's close this uh, and let's go back back to the vehicle assembly building so we can take a look at some of the new historic parts. There's a ton of different capsules which I'm just going to stack on top of each other because I'm strange. So these are these circular ones, these spherical ones are supposed to be the the Russian designs. There are three of them. You notice they have different masses and they have different numbers of, of crew members but they are all roughly the same size. This is a Gemini capsule, there is, well, we, the Mercury capsule is obviously already in the game. We have a lander, right, so that's supposed to be the LEM. Now, one thing to note is if we compare the the new Mark 1-3, there is a definite size difference between these two objects. And the reason is there's now two new tank radii, two new tank sizes that are allowed in the game. So if I just throw these around, we can go and grab the big tanks. So I think this is the biggest tank that is now available here. It is a 5 meter tank. So you can build yourself your, your Apollo first stage. In fact, they have this nice little adapter down the bottom for you to attach engines. There is also a 1.85 meter set of tanks. Like, I think this is one. That's right. There we go. And obviously all the new ones come in multiple paint schemes so you can mix and match them and make them look the part. Uh, since we're building R7, your know, Soyuz and Sputnik variants, you can also get these external boosters that uh, will let you make wonderful Korolev crosses in the skies. 
Now for the engines, there are engines that are all historically appropriate. First of all, since we've got the R7 stuff attached to the side here, this is uh, supposed to be based on the, the RD107 engines that were used on these originally. Uh, now, of course, with the different designs, the these parts actually change the not just the colors but the model itself so you can have a small shroud or you can have a 1.85 meter shroud so you can really look the part there now uh what else do we have the bobcat is supposed to look a bit like the engines for the um the gemini so they can make that boop sound when they fire up those were hypergolic engines that propelled the gemini spacecraft the cheetah is an engine designed for the... I believe the, the Cheetah is the engine which is the descent module for the lunar module. Or the descent engine for... yeah. Going up a size, we have the service propulsion system from the Apollo spacecraft. That is the uh, Wolfhound. Again, a couple of variants here. And the, R, the Skiff, I believe these are supposed to be based on the J2. Just look at those helium spheres, right, that are sitting on the outside. That is that is supposed to be a J2. And if you actually look again, you have different variations here. Uh, then, of course, you get to the big one. You get the big massive monster, the F1 engine. And if I go back to this, you can see how we fit all these things together, right? So we'll stick this on the bottom. And now if I want to make something that looks like a Saturn V with its five engines, uh, attach it and then get rid of these extensions and it looks the part there you go so that, that actually looks relatively decent it's kind of cool it's got uh, they've definitely really tried to derive these looks from the various spacecraft now there's another way to match chunks of engines together if you look down in the coupling section there are engine plates now the engine plates are designed to accommodate multiple thrusters and you can tweak through them by changing the cluster mode. So there's like a quad mode thruster there. Once again, we're gonna grab say, uh, let's let's go, yeah, let's grab this one, right? Just stick another set of F1s on there. If I shrink this down. Now, the advantage of this is when you wanna attach your stage underneath, it has an extra node which is created right there. See that? And it will create a fairing of the correct size and correct length. Now, you can actually adjust the length of the fairing here just by tweaking back and forth so you can get something that is roughly right for your rocket. So that means, yeah, you can stick your stack decoupler in there, which is, of course, all newly redesigned so that when you stage, this thing actually looks correct. Because we, we, it's been really hard to do interstage fairings reliably in the game. So these thrust plates are going to help you deal with that. And you have them, of course, for uh, many, many sizes. Basically 1.85, 2.5, 3.75, and all the way up to 5 meters. So, of course, you can build something that looks a little like the R7 using the Soviet parts. But, hey, we're mashing up history here. And it's entirely within the rules of the game that you could say put that on top of a Saturn V first stage, or at least something like it. Also, you can choose to say launch from a different location. They've added the Woomerang launch site, which uh, presumably is in Kerbal, Australia, wherever that is. I mean, presumably it's next to Kerbal, New Zealand, where the Electron rocket is. There, let's go throttles 100% and off it goes. Beautiful. Let's just start the thing going towards those big mountains. Let's take a look at actually where we are. We are, oh, like way far north. And this is obviously because we want, players want to be able to have missions where you have to deal with inclination changes. Kerbal players have been spoiled by having a launch site, which is basically on the equator. It means they don't need to worry about issues related to their spacecraft not ending up in different launch planes. If, or if they do, it's entirely down to their own doing, so it's not such a big deal. Anyway, as of right now, making history is still only in the hands of a few early testers, but the new version, the actual release, will be coming soon, and it will be available to everybody on Steam. The console version will apparently come out later. But we're also f expecting some fixes to the console versions for a few points which have been discovered since the game was released.
Also, this is a paid expansion. There is a free update that goes along with it, which adds a few features. The paid update is going to actually be free to those people who were early adopters and bought the game before April of 2013. And of course, if you just want parts that look like Apollo or Soyuz, the mods that give those still exist if that's what you want. But of course, the main attraction of the DLC is supposed to be the mission builder and the various missions. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.